To walk through the streets of Port Jervis, New York at times feels like a time warp that takes you back to the 1950s when life was slower, neighbors truly knew one another, and heroes came from your own hometown. Those heroes weren't so much a part of culture, but rather the folks who defended it. Port Jervis is a, it's a little town in the middle of nowhere, and in our town we've had three heroes. Two guys that went on to become Olympic wrestlers and bring home medals, and our number one hero, Walter Hughes, World War II hero who fought over in Europe. At 85 years of age, Walter Hughes is still sharp as a tack. He has wit and eyes that tell more than he is often willing to say. His silence at times is not about secrets or regret, post-traumatic stress, or even memories too painful to revisit. Sometimes his silence is all about the respect of his fallen brothers and the time-honored tradition of a hero's humility. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York as a kid. I was born on October 29, 1925. My father died when I was seven. He died of black lung, he was a coal worker. I learned to survive. I, I, as a kid, I shined shoes with my future wife's brother, Frank. My mother uh, married my stepfather in 1932, I think it was. And at that 12 years old, my stepfather introduced me to the tugboats, which became my life's occupation. For almost 50 years, Walter served the river on a tugboat in every capacity from deckhand to captain. His only break came when he volunteered for the Army during World War II and became a devil in baggy pants. I went in the Army because I wanted to be a tugboat man in the Army because the Army had a lot of tugboats. And instead, they sent me to Fort Bragg to tug a cannon around. And I didn't like that, so I volunteered for the Airborne, became a paratrooper. The men who wear this paratrooper insignia can be counted on to strike behind enemy lines or to swiftly reinforce our troops along any front, anywhere in the world. The Airborne was a new elite unit, and they paid $50 more a month. With five day jumps and two night jumps under his belt, he was off to war with I Company, the 504th Regiment of the 82nd Airborne. I wanted to be right up in front. I thought better of that later on, but uh, I wanted to be, if I was going to be in the service in the Army, I wanted to be right up there where I could do the most good. Wet behind the ears and having an aura about him that others describe as unshakable, Walter Hughes arrived to Europe just in time to see war up close and personal. I arrived in England just in time to make Operation Market Garden, which was to jump in Holland. And that was September 17, 1944. It was the first time I jumped in combat. I was apprehensive about it, but it was the first daylight jump of any uh, in Europe, and uh, it was the largest airborne operation in World War II. They flooded Holland with paratroopers, and it, it, they almost it clouded out the sun. <laughs> Walter Hughes was only 18 years old when he parachuted into Operation Market Garden. 35,000 paratroopers filled the sky on the initial jump, into the event made famous by the movie, A Bridge Too Far. As our airborne troops parachuted to the ground 65 miles behind enemy lines, Germans hid at the edge of the tree line, attempting to kill them before they ever hit the ground. There were some casualties uh, and when we got on the ground, but uh, we, we fought from that point on up to Nijmegen. Once on the ground, Walter Hughes traveled to the banks of the Wall River for a crossing to take the Nijmegen Bridge. The boats were supposed to be there by midnight, one o'clock in the morning, to go over in the dark. British troops responsible for delivering their boats and providing cover support had failed to make it. They didn't get the boats there until close to one, two o'clock in the afternoon, which meant that we had to cross the river in broad daylight. It was like a suicide mission. When I saw the boats that they had in the trucks, I, I, I was a river man, I was a tugboat man. I knew they didn't look like they belonged in a duck pound, let alone a wide river and, and a fast moving river. And uh, I got really scared then. The boats were canvas and they were collapsible. Uh, they came in flat uh, pods like and when, when you put them together, you pull up the side of the canvas, and then they had 
sticks that you stuck in along the side from one from the bow to the stern, and uh, that's how they 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 were made. No protection whatsoever. Uh, they wouldn't stop a BB gun, let alone a, a, a bullet. And I didn't I didn't think they'd float. Not with 12 men in it. I didn't think I'd ever get that close to a German because I never thought I'd survive the river. You were supposed to have about six paddles in each boat. I saw three. So the men started using their M1 rifle stocks for paddles. They waited until we got right in the middle of the river. So we thought we were clear. And then we started getting firing from the railroad bridge, from the shore, from the bank. Big shells, 40 millimeter, 20 millimeter. I saw one boat get hit right with an 88 and just disintegrated. It was just like shooting ducks in a shooting gun. You had a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling. There was a lot of wounded. The guy in front of me, he got hit with something real heavy, whatever it was, because he, he jumped right up almost on top of me. And I heard him yelling. And the next thing I know, he, he fell over in there uh, against the gunnel. And uh, his hand was in the water. And somebody said, pull him back in the boat. The boat started to turn around from his hand. And uh, he was dead. I knew he was dead. And uh, it scared me. I didn't even want to look at him. And, uh, I, all of a sudden I realized this is not a movie, this is, a, this is for real. I could die here, uh, but I said, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna make it up to that bank. I said, if I make it up there, I'm gonna make it the rest of the way. And I did. I was very lucky, very lucky. God was watching over me that day. Of the 260 men who crossed the river that day, 48 died, and the vast majority were wounded. That day, Walter found leadership and direction in another 19-year-old warrior who had already been seasoned by combat named Francis Xavier Keefe. When we went to shore, I, w I looked over from the cover, and I knew we had to get to the embankment because if the enemy had more reinforcements coming to the embankment, we would have quite a few more killed and, and wounded. I turned around and I said, everybody we're gonna move out. And uh, there was a hesitation. I said, well, we'll all die here if we don't move out. We ran toward the dike. We had about five, 600 yards to, of open land to go across before we got to the protection of the dike. And I was right with Francis Keefe. Uh, he was right with, ahead of me. And uh, when we both got to the dike, that's when Francis Keefe got hit. I got hit in the, in the wrist. My whole hand just seemed to fall right off. His hand was hanging down in a terrible looking position. I started wrapping his hand to try to keep it together. While we were doing that, he gets hit again in the shoulder by another German bullet. And then he yelled, and I think it was another bullet that went through his cheek. And I got hit in the, in the mouth with a, a piece of shrapnel, I believe. Was they it most likely came from the bracelet I was wearing. Of course, the, the bullet hit the bracelet and took it right through the wound. But he had been hit three times within the, just a few seconds. And uh, we finally got his hand bandaged. And, uh, and while, while I was bandaging, I said, Francis, I think you'll probably wind up going back to the States. Can I have your 45? Because he, I had no 45, I was a replacement and I, all I had was my Tommy gun. I said, take it, don't bother me. So anyway, he took the, the weapon and I understand that he used it later on that day. His 45 saved my life about 20 minutes later up on the bridge. And uh, Lieutenant Blankenship and Captain Burris, they were ahead of me. And when they went past this pillbox, Two Germans came from the other side around it. They were right in front of me. And both of them pegged shots at me. And one of them, one of them caught me in the uh, Tommy gun uh, clip and almost knocked me over. The other one caught the, the stock of the Tommy gun 
and shattered it. I, I had no choice. I had, I had nothing but 45, and I couldn't turn around and run because they would have shot me anyway. So I ran at them. I ran at them and pointed the gun at them and kept up. I kept firing it until it was empty, and they went down. My adrenaline kept going and kept me going and, uh, until we got to the other side of the bridge. That scared me. My first combat, the first time I ever killed anybody. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the last. But I'm here because of that. Uh, anyway, I'm here because of Francis. On December 16, 1944, the largest and bloodiest battle for American forces in World War II got underway. We were uh, regrouping at Sassone, France and we were alerted that the Germans had broke through in the Ardennes, and we were sent up there in trucks. That's when the Battle of the Bulge started, and we fought right through until February, and it was the coldest that it had been in over 40 years. In the latter part of the Battle of the Bulge, I developed trench foot and frozen feet. Try as he might to convince his superiors that he needed to remain, he was sent to the Cider Blue Aid Station, and eventually Paris for treatment. The doctor said that he was going to have to amputate several of my toes or my foot. But I didn't let him do it. I went AWOL out of the hospital, and I went back to my outfit, thanks to the Red Ball Express. The troopers of the Red Ball Express knew where most of the outfits were because they supplied everything on, on the front lines. And that's how we got back to the 504. Toward the end of the war, Walter and the men of the 504th 82nd Airborne were tasked to travel north of Berlin to Ludwigslust to liberate what they thought were American flyers from a POW camp. When they got there, what they found shocked them beyond words, beyond comprehension. It was close to the end of the war up the Elbe River and the lieutenant came in and said that there was a prison camp close to us and that he wanted a couple of platoons to go in and see what we could find there. So we, we went into the uh, area where the camp was, which was Ludwiglust in, in, uh, in Germany. And uh, we liberated it. it was, there was victims in there. There was concentration camp victims. Uh, there was boxcars where the women stayed. And uh, my first impression when I walked in there, well, the, the stench of the urine and that, you could, you could smell that in almost a mile away. And uh, I felt so bad when I walked in there, and saw the bodies laying around, and there was piles of people laying there, and most of them were dead. Some of them were still alive because you could see an eyelash flicker or a finger move in a hand, and they knew that they weren't yet dead. The local towns, the people, they claimed they knew nothing of the camp. I don't know whether it was General Ridgeway or General Gavin. They ordered that the people be brought out there and shown, and they were ordered to bury the victims. My whole idea of the war at that time changed. I always thought the, Ameri the German soldier was fighting for his country, I was fighting for my country. But when I saw at that camp, what they did, uh, my attitude changed completely. Walter Hughes is a full-fledged, card-carrying member of the greatest generation. He is a guy who's looked down the barrel of his German adversary, charged enemy pill bunkers, and who jumped 60-plus miles behind enemy lines. I could have came home early. I had the points to come home early. But I stayed with the division because they found out they were going to march in New York City. And I, had, I wanted my mother to see that. She wanted to see it, so I did that. Then we went home. I, I, I got uh, discharged from the service, got acquainted with my friend Frankie again. I found out he had a, uh, a sister named Mary, and she was a beautiful girl, and she became my wife. I went back to work on the tugboats, became a tugboat captain. I did a good job. and. Uh, I stayed on the boats until 1956, and then I went to work in New York as a tugboat dispatcher. 
When I retired in 1988, my wife told me, she says, you have to get yourself a hobby. I said, what should I do? She said, well, you can do anything you want except number one, no drinking, num number two, no gambling, number three, no chasing other women. I said, it kind of leaves you uh, in a lurch there, but I says, all right. So she bought me a guitar and I started, started learning how to play the guitar. And after two weeks of three cording her to death, she said to me, Walter, do me a favor. I said, what's that? She said, pick one of the other three. To come first and through the door for Casey laid them out. File them through the window as they heard Casey shout. I was married 56 wonderful years. We were engaged for a year before we were married. And uh, it was a wonderful life. Uh, I, I lost her two years ago and uh, I miss her very much. But we did, we, we did have a good life. We started with nothing, because I didn't have anything. She had a job and she saved money. She used to put $20 a, a week in, in the bank from her $40 a week salary. <laughs> Talk too much. We started with a kitchen set that was four orange crates. Believe it or not, but that was good. It was a good start. I get scared when I think back how we did live and how we're living now. Uh, our nation has, has to come back because if it doesn't, it's not gonna be a nation. That's the way I feel. Uh, my wife used to say to me, Walton, you're up in your 80s. Why does it upset you? I used to tell her, Mary, this is my country. I fought for it, I love it. I love the flag, and I believe it's, it can be saved, and I says, I hope it does. I feel bad today when I see some of these young kids today, they got their pants down to their ankles, and, and uh, you can see the crack in their rear end, and, and they got beads in their eyes, their nose, and their ears, and God knows where else. And uh, I've, I feel sorry for them in a way. Uh, but then I think back at the young kids that I see in uniform. I see our, our Army, our Navy, our Marine Corps. Uh, and then I, I say, well, this country is not going to go anywhere. It's going to come back and because of the likes of kids that we have in the service and because of the likes of the kids like the junior ROTC kids in the, in the high schools and that. A1 students, most of them, and I thank God for that. Recently, Walter attended a jump school in Frederick, Oklahoma that not only certifies men in static line parachuting, but does so through the authenticity of the World War II experience. All attendees must wear the actual uniforms and dress of those that jumped during World War II. They jump from the same C-47 type aircraft that once carried Walter and his fellow paratroopers to war. I had the opportunity to fly with the men that jumped last night. I'm in, in the plane with the roar of the engines, brought me back to 1944. And the men, I felt like I wanted to get up and stand with them and do what they were doing because I did it so many years ago. But no, I, I, it brings back a lot of memories. What's bringing back a lot more memories is the pictures I see of some of our veterans here that they put on the walls of, of this plane. Everybody that's on the wall has made the jumps out of these planes. Some of them are here, some of them are gone already. A lot of them are gone. Walter knows that the torchbearers of his generation are falling fast. He has no illusion of longevity or endless days to come and frequently says that if he died today, he'd have little regret. 
How you begin to tell the story of a hero with so many experiences is more difficult than one can imagine. How you honor a man who spilt his blood, jumped behind enemy lines, and stared death down so many times in the face of the enemy is difficult to capture in meaningful words. People and to uh, told us World War II veterans that we were the greatest generation. A book was wrote about it. I don't believe that. I believe the generation today is much greater. They're all volunteers, and uh, they're, they're put in positions where they can't win a war because of political activity. And, and uh, uh, I believe that they have a tough, tougher job than we did. Walter Hughes is the real deal. He is a man who loves his country, loved his wife, and awakes each day determined to see if he can make this day different. I've had a very good life. I've been very lucky. I, I'm very fortunate. If I, they put me in a box tomorrow, I'm way ahead of the game. So I can't kick. I'm, I, I got one foot on the banana peel and the other in the grave, so. When I slip and I'm going to go in that box with a big smile on my face. Glory, glory, glory.